When you hear the name or read the words Loch Ness, it's impossible not to think about the Loch Ness Monster. In many ways, the monster element takes the spotlight and the centre stage, which some people thoroughly enjoy, but can leave others feeling rather frustrated. But after all these years, Loch Ness itself and the mystery of the Loch Ness Monster still remain strong, and both elements will continue to attract Nessie enthusiasts as well as members from the scientific community. For me personally, that's a win-win scenario. If you know anything about my background and my journey to Loch Ness, then you'll be aware that it was Tim Dinsdale in his book, The Story of the Loch Ness Monster, that caught my attention first. From that moment on, I've looked into all possible theories about what the Loch Ness Monster could be. And through that curiosity, I eventually found Adrian Shine and the Loch Ness Project, two very different men with different beliefs, but both have inspired hundreds, if not thousands of people, including me. As new theories emerged over the years, they not only shed light on the possibility of an unknown creature living in the loch, but it also opens up new avenues for understanding the history and the ecology of Loch Ness. Regardless of what we believe, I feel at times that we actually owe the Loch Ness Monster a special thanks, because without it, we wouldn't have this incredible catalogue of knowledge provided by those who have came before us. I love exploring all the possible explanations, despite the outcome, and observing the Nessie community working together gives me a real sense of belonging. We've all read about the natural environment and how it can contribute towards many sightings recorded by an eyewitness. But to actually see that explanation with your own eyes certainly provides perspective. A few months ago, we set out to capture one of these explanations while patrolling the shoreline around the loch and went on deep scan with Ali Matheson. We were on the hunt for a standing wave. As always, we sent out the invitations for anyone to join us, and I was delighted to hear that l &E member and friend Jared Christie was going to be joining me for the day. And here's the legend himself. Now I've known Jared for several years now following a chance meeting at a local shop in Drum the Drocket, and it's safe to say that we instantly got on with one another. He's a great guy. But today, Jared was a man on a mission and determined to capture that standing wave. And he demonstrated that enthusiasm by visiting several observation points throughout the day. We respectfully asked Nessie to take the day off so that we could focus on boat traffic and their wakes as they traveled up and down the loch's surface. It's no secret that my favorite piece of potential evidence comes from a video that was recorded from Arctic Castle back in 1992. The Nessie community still remains split on the conclusion, and I can understand why. But Jared and I were hoping to capture something similar, which is far easier said than done, as the conditions would need to be spot on. But what is a standing wave, and how are they created? A standing wave occurs when two boat wakes of the exact same frequency and amplitude are moving in the opposite direction on the surface of the loch. When the two boat wakes finally meet and interfere with one another, the results have the potential to create a standing wave. Now I'll stress that point one more time. The boat wakes need to be identical. So with that in mind, there's never a lot more to consider here, such as the boat itself, its size, the direction of travel and its current speed. A small boat with a smaller engine will most definitely produce a wake different from a much larger boat. It is a complex procedure, especially in open water, but it can happen. If we take a closer look at the footage from 1992, we'll discover some details that may challenge the standing wave explanation. You can very clearly see a dark object moving on the surface of the loch. The movement itself is unusual, and at times it does appear to submerge briefly, only to reappear again. If we freeze the video 
and turn our attention to the top and the bottom of this image. We can easily highlight the classic Kelvin Wake, which is heading in the direction of Fort Augustus. The wake at the top is also easy to highlight, but it's unclear at this moment in time in which direction it's travelling. By highlighting and covering these two prominent boat wakes, we can now focus on the area around the object. As previously mentioned, in order to create a standing wave, the boat wakes need to be identical in frequency, velocity and amplitude. But there's actually very little to observe in this highlighted area apart from the object itself. You can see in this clip that the top and the bottom wake have yet to meet and interfere with one another. If indeed this is a standing wave, then where are the boat wakes that have interfered with one another? What I also find really interesting is just how isolated this commotion appears to be. We already know that a boat wake can remain on the lock surface for a long period of time, even with no boats in sight. And I've observed this many times before when at Loch Ness. But I'm still not convinced that what we're looking at is wave interference. Our friend and fellow investigator Dick Rayner recently shared his thoughts and highlighted another possible explanation. Dick has suggested that the isolated disturbance may have been caused by speedboats racing up and down the loch, especially during a sharp turn manoeuvre, which can create some interesting wave formations. I recently reached out to Dr Tom Davy, who's responsible for the engineering team at Flowwave within Edinburgh University. I was hoping to attend a demonstration to recreate a standing wave in a controlled environment, but I believe I left this request too late as availability won't resume again for another month. But until then, have a look at these controlled experiments as they try to recreate a standing wave. Having an open mind should be statutory practice when exploring and investigating Loch Ness. I've poured hours of my time into this footage in hoping to identify the exact explanation. But that level of dedication does have its own pros and cons. I want this to be messy. I truly do. But has that wishful thinking clouded my own judgement to the point where I can no longer see waves and I can only see one solid dark object? That's entirely possible and I'll happily acknowledge it, so please don't take my word for gospel. It's also important to note that this footage was filmed from within Urquhart Castle and you can clearly see that it's still tourist season. So why wasn't there more excitement from those who were there and for those who had a clear view? We need to remember that this all happened in 1992. There were no smartphones back then and not everybody had access to a camcorder. I would also like to add that Ali Matheson and I have watched this footage together several times. He's a highly experienced skipper who has spent a remarkable amount of time on the loch. But he also believes that this is not a standing wave. But he has suggested seals, which is a fair explanation. But this also goes to show that we're still no closer to identifying the object in this 1992 footage. I would much rather see everyone doing their own analysis and sharing it with others within the LNE group. So please feel free to watch this footage and perhaps you can find something that we've missed. I've titled this video The Best of Both Worlds and on reflection, I'm proud to say that that's actually more of a statement rather than anything else. This is Loch Ness Exploration, not Monster Hunter monster mad beastie hunter or cryptomania, but Loch Ness exploration. I believe it to be a fairly obvious terminology and it suggests investigation, research, expedition, observation, review and journey. I want to cover as much ground as possible when it comes to Loch Ness and having you guys there makes all the difference. I've said that Loch Ness will continue to attract those who consider themselves as Nessie enthusiasts, as well as individuals or teams from the scientific community. 
So let's explore the best of both worlds. On the 13th of June, I hit the road nice and early heading north to Loch Ness. As tradition, I would normally listen to a podcast based on Nessie, but on this particular journey, my mind was filled with questions, scenarios and possibilities, all within good reason. Truth be told, I barely slept that night due to how excited I was for the day ahead of me. I found myself in a privileged position to experience something new, intriguing and insightful. Aberdeen University was heading to Loch Ness and to the Loch Ness Centre, and with them, they brought technology that was both groundbreaking and state-of-the-art. Its name? The Wee Holocam. The Wee Holocam is the most compact device of its type, as well as the fastest in terms of image and processing time. It's incredibly ambitious and highly successful, as one single 30-minute underwater deployment can generate close to 100,000 images. The scientists and the research team have developed one of the most state-of-the-art subsea holographic cameras in the world, and it's capable of rapid 3D imaging of marine organisms and microparticles. The Wii Holocam is a huge step in the right direction as the normal process of monitoring plankton species requires significant work in terms of capturing the organisms, identifying and photographing each and individual species. It can be a long and challenging process, but now that the wee holocam is here, you could say that as a game changer for present and future studies of microparticles. It's already been deployed at sea and saltwater locks around Scotland such as Loch U and Loch Etif, to monitor microscopic organisms within the water column. But this is the first time that the wee holocam is being deployed in a freshwater loch, such as Loch Ness. We spent four hours in deep scan that afternoon, deploying the wee holocam at certain locations around Loch Ness and at different depths. The deepest depth we reached was beyond 188 metres. By using this camera, each hologram can be considered as a stack of thousands of 2D images, and the team have developed an algorithm that rapidly reconstructs these 2D images, identifying the particles, extracting them to create a 3D version. It was an absolute privilege to take part in this research, and being able to explore some of the results in real time was absolutely fascinating. If I'm being completely honest with everyone, I was anxious when Continuum arrived at Loch Ness, as I was worried that the scientific studies and the research would be pushed to the back of the queue. So as you can imagine, I was over the moon with joy when I found out that the Loch Ness Centre was reaching out to the universities both at home and abroad. Those who are deeply invested in the Loch Ness story would often tell the Loch Ness Centre that carrying this legacy is a huge responsibility and it comes with immense pressure to deliver valuable insight. I'm absolutely delighted that the Loch Ness Centre has kept to their word and will continue to pursue the scientific community and those involved in education. So there you have it, the best of both worlds, where messy micro monsters and science can happily coexist with one another. We'll see you at the next one when we visit Loch Ness.